the podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melissa, your Stephen King veteran. Hi, I'm Ben, the Stephen King and horror film fanboy. And hello, I'm Luke, your first time Stephen King reader. And we are here talking about Stephen King's It. We are on Dairy, the fourth interlude. This section was 18 pages long, which was only 1.65% of the book. <laughs> yeah, not, 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 not. It was short. It was sweet. Well, it wasn't really sweet. There was not much to it. Um, and just for our listeners today, we it is Benji and I are here. Yes, unfortunately, Luke is not able to join us today, but for this chapter, that's okay for this <laughs> section. We decided to talk about it without him because, I mean, let's be honest, when you've seen one serial killer in this book, you've seen them all. Yeah, it, it, I, I kind of made this point in our private chats and everything with this chapter. It's not a bad chapter. Had this, or this section, this interlude, had this interlude been attached to, like, interlude number three, it'd been perfect. It'd been fine. Mm -hmm. But, and I'll get this out of the way, we've seen this. We've seen the serial killer. We've seen the rampant just murder and mayhem a few times now, and we get it. Derry doesn't care kind of thing. So it's a, it's a very oddly placed interlude. And uh, yeah, I mean, I get that they need an interlude. I, I feel like it's a good spot for an interlude. I mm -hmm. just it was not probably my fa it's not my favorite of the interludes. So so with that, let's go ahead and just jump into let's let's talk about drunk Mike first. What, <laughs> what's your overall feeling about drunk Mike? Yeah, I absolutely love drunken Mike. Uh, this it, it was funny. It was uh, it, it did make me laugh uh, a good amount. Uh, but I love the call call out on the uppity liberal uh, chick wanting to understand the black experience. And Mike's like, yeah, people don't you know people don't understand the Jews, but they understand this. And it's just calling her out, and she's shocked. And oh, it's like stop it. You know, you're trying to you know. I, I just like Mike calling her out on that and making her her feel stupid yeah, it, it was funny it was funny i think like it's interesting that given like the way i feel about sort of being an ally to um people of color for me it's like it's almost like she was trying that but didn't know how and because mike's so used to just probably the underlying racism that surrounds him that like it's like not a thing it's just like his life and that's what it is and people know it and that's it's just very different than today's sort of view of it so it's funny that he as the black man is like this is the way it is it's just life that that now we're starting to get finally the idea of how do we actually help that or the people trying to help yeah and, and or, you know no absolutely and sorry i wasn't and that's a whole to... rabbit hole we can go down and <laughs> We don't have to, but Drunk Mike was awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely agreed. Uh, and yeah, I, I do agree with you. She was, she was, she meant it for best intentions. It just, when it comes off that way, when it's like, eh, you, yes, you know, yeah. yes, it, she had a savior complex and it's like, yeah, you know, I, I don't need you to come save me from this. Like we're, we're good. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Speaking of things that are awesome, um, can we talk about Thurgood? Because his accent is fantastic. <laughs> the most fun thing to do is to try and read his stuff out loud. Yeah, and I, I can understand that. I, we're, as again, me and Luke are audiobook listeners. And so it, it's when you first hear it, it's like, what the fuck did he just say? You know, because and then luckily the narrator does go translation, <laughs> you know, trying to actually, you know, explain in uh, common tongue uh, what was said. Well, <laughs> go ahead. It's so funny because like I, as I'm literally reading it, I have to read it out loud. It's Davy Ardwell, what a main who walk like he own half of the world and had him a de la on the rest. <laughs> as soon as I read it out loud, I got it. I could do that. But just reading it you're like yeah that's like a whole other language yeah I, I i just like when authors choose to write things out phonetically as it sounds when mm -hmm. people are talking 
Yeah, no, like I, I agree with you. It's awesome, but at the same time, it's one of the more frustrating because he. I think he, there was another interlude. He kind of did the same thing with her. I might just be thinking of this one. Or, or I think it was uh, the old uh, logger from the fr- second interlude uh, at the gay bar, uh, kind of thing. And uh, but yeah, it's when he does this kind of thing, it's very interesting but it's frustrating as a guy who doesn't read well or hear things well like i have to read it several times to catch it and but i i I do like it i like exactly what you said of they take the time to give a character a character yes all right so i see you've got you've got a quote you want to kind of jump to so you want to go ahead and start there sure hero was a was sly and he was mean and i suppose then the novel that would preclude any good qualities at all but sometimes when a man has spent a life being distrusted and distrustful being a loner or a loser both by choice and by reason of society's opinions of him he can find a friend or a lover and simply live for that person the way a dog lives for his master that's the way it seems to have been between hero and hartwell and so uh hero yeah very much uh and, and several men following hartwell uh it's interesting to see uh the kind of people the love and admiration that they have for him and i think you have a uh note that kind of goes along with that i do and i i wish i wouldn't have written it because i didn't know this was the quote that you had it oh. They, they, it's like they're, um, King is purposely trying to get us to make some connections to our losers group mm-hmm. by calling him a loner or a loser with a capital L. But how Haro thinks of Hartwell is really how we see Eddie thinking about Bill. Yes. It's, it's very similar between like our losers and this like past generation of losers. No, I, I absolutely agreed. Go ahead, though. Oh, I think that was kind of it. Just, I like the idea of the, um, what is it the parallels yeah there you the, go exactly. there's words it's working yeah the the uh not mirror the the rever- reverberations Ooh, like the ripples yeah exactly it kind of ebbs and flows kind of thing and because of your note is actually why i quoted that line uh i seen ah. your note first and i was like that's a great point and i, I don't want to steal your thunder but i was just kind of uh making note of it because I did see that line and you're absolutely right. It's uh, very much Hero is an Eddie style. He was sly and mean looking and Eddie's not really mean looking, but sly, you know, sly and slender kind of that kind of thing where you don't think he's going to be that much of a threat. And that's why he follows Hartwell being the man. So then we go ahead and we sort of get into the night at the bar, right? So Hartwell is Hartwell is in a hotel and he's killed by some unknown people along with some other of his group. But Hero gets away. Months go by. And then we're in the bar mm-hmm. with the group of people who are allegedly the killers of Hartwell, right? Hartwell, yeah. who they found his toes shoved in his mouth. So gross. <laughs> right. um, and like... I just had a comment on one of these gentlemen. His name is Lathrop Rounds. That's his actual given name, but they call him El Katuk. I can't decide which is a better name. They're both <laughs> awesome. Why waste them on the same person when you could have two different characters with these amazing names? I, it was just like something that stood out to me there. Yeah, no, I, I, I agreed. Yeah, I, I'd probably go El Katuk just because oh, Lathrop sounds kind of dumb but but it's a great character in a book name like i wouldn't name my kid lathrop but you know exactly if if i'm writing a book that yeah you you gotta make you gotta stand make them stand out and this thing is it's a standout Mm -hmm. name for a throwaway character exactly you know so it's yeah i i absolutely see where you're going with that and then we do some chopping (laughs) yeah it was a very detailed uh murder spree Yes, it was well detailed. I like how specific it was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, I, I'm not gonna lie, this one stood out to me a bit because of this is the known, uh, especially since we get into it later on uh, the, the, in the next section of uh, just dairy not giving a fuck. Like, literally, mm-hmm. there's guys still sitting at the bar while there's a guy getting his arm chopped off at the poker table. <laughs> you know, like, and she just getting hatcheted. Like, here's the here's the first, like, two paragraphs, three paragraphs of the scene, right? So, Hiro had come in. He was drinking. And it says, after he finished his second schooner of beer, Hiro excused himself to Thoroughgood, picked up his two-hander, and went back to the table, table where Mueller's men were playing five-card stud. Then he started chopping. 
Floyd Calderwood had just poured himself a glass of rye whiskey and was setting the bottle back down when Hero arrived and chopped Calderwood's, Calder, Calderwood's hand off at the wrist. Calderwood looked at his hand and screamed. It was still holding the bottle, but all of a sudden it wasn't attached to anything but wet gristle and trailing veins. For a moment, the severed hand clutched the bottle even tighter. Then it fell off and lay on the table like a dead spider. Blood spouted from his wrist. At the bar, somebody called for more beer. And someone else asked the bartender, whose name was Jonesy, if he still dyed his hair. Like, dude just got his hand chopped off, not 20 feet from you. And so I'm going to get a beer and we're going to talk about your hair and we're going to like hang out and keep drinking, drinking. No. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's just because, again, we've seen the signs of this, but we've never seen it to this extent of, like I said, dairy not giving a fuck. It's literally just, oh, yeah, there, there's Hero. Hey. And even they, they call it out like he's been on the run because he murdered a couple of other guys oh, yeah. early on. Uh, or maybe did not. he murder? No, he was part of the group that got murdered, and he got away. He got away, and yeah, so he was a wanted man, quote unquote, by the red. Like by, the because they yeah. wanted to still get him. Yes, yeah. yes, that's what it was. Uh, but you know, so he was a wanted man, and he just strolls into the bar. Nobody says a word, and it's just they say hello, hey, hey, hello, you know, blah blah blah, trying to be nice and kind. But nobody put two and two together that this guy's gonna, you know, axe someone. He comes in with an axe in hand. It's not even, you know. Well, okay, but technically, since it is a logging town, maybe right. everybody walks in with their axe, this, right? This, like this spirit, I, I would expect at this time, you know, at this time in history, you'd have axe holder rungs. If I had a bar, I'm going to put like I'm gonna have like hold your axe, you know, holder kind of coat, <laughs> coat, coat holder things. Uh, just, and just put a couple axes up there. Exactly. Just, you know, no big deal, right? You yeah. put your horse out front and your axe inside. Exactly. No <laughs> Another thing that really stood out to me on the whole, like, not only are we getting very specific chopping of the bits, but also of like nobody really paying attention. Mm -hmm. Um, we're talking about Elkatuk, right? It says, meantime, Elkatuk was crawling busily toward the door with his hair hanging in his face. Hero swung the axe again, snarling and gibbering. And a moment later, Katuk's severed head was rolling across the sawdust-strewn floor. A tongue popped bizarrely out between his teeth. It rolled to a stop by the booted foot of a lumberman named Varney, who had spent most of the day in the dollar and who, by then, was so exquisitely slopped he didn't know if he was on land or sea. He kicked the head away without looking down to see what it was and hollered for Jonesy to run him down another beer. <laughs> You kicked a head. Yeah. They're very Theon of you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I like I know that it's hard to take notes on this kind of chapter, and yes, we've seen it, but the detail with which King so explicitly tells us of the chopping. And like the idea that Hurt Thorogood had enough wherewithal to remember these details, even though he just sat there drinking. Yeah. Like I it's an interesting juxtaposition to me. No, absolutely agreed. And again, as much as I want to hate quote unquote on this chapter because we've seen it before, it's so well done. I mean, again, had we seen this uh, earlier or in, at any other point in the uh, story, mm -hmm. it, it would stand out like this is an awesome story. This is great. And but this one just felt like a slog. But I absolutely agree that. Yeah, the detail he goes into, because I think it's like seven or eight pages, at least on the Kindle version of the massacre itself. Right. Just, just so it's like that, that that that's some detailed information, you know, going through. Yeah, exactly. So so the only other thing I have about the entire, if you will, and then we can get into some of your, I know you've got some other like, bigger theme thoughts, if you will. Stugly Grenier is like the last or one of the people who actually hurts Thoreau, right? First mm -hmm. of all, he has a terrible name. <laughs> Stugly. That's a bad name. Stugly. But he has terrible aim. Right? He had been aiming at the crazed lumberman's head. The bullet struck home in the fleshy part of Hero's thigh. <laughs> Dude, you had a gun. You were aiming for his head and you hit him, but you hit him in the thigh. How bad is your aim? I'm I'm a little so, disappointed in you. Uh, so I'm I'm gonna be honest. You never shoot as somebody who has trained extensively in firearms, you never aim for the head because it's such a small target anyway. You know, you always go for center of mass. That's the yeah. you know, key thing. You never aim for the head. Uh, but it's understandable with the, if you're not trained in, you know, high stress situations, you could be aiming up here shaking and just freaking out and then just pull the trigger and the barrel just dips. So it's, I, I, I yes, the aim is horrible All at right. the same time. 
the understanding because he's yeah he he's in fear for his life the adrenaline's pumping it's understandable i'm not saying it's great you should be you know because yeah that's not that hard shoot him in the chest and there you go be done with it don't aim for the damn head right well and if you're aiming for the head like the thigh is like i I, that's really far i'm just saying like i don't know anyway i'm glad that hero didn't actually get too hurt like yeah okay shoot shot in the leg is not great but yeah yeah well at this point he didn't get too hurt (laughs) we'll get there in a few minutes Uh, all right so then your next thought yeah so it kind of goes on to uh later on when uh, mike's just straight up talking with uh thoroughgood and thoroughgood saw pennywise and he admits that he Mm -hmm. had seen pennywise from time to time of uh you know throughout the years even not just uh at, at the bar, he's like, yeah, yeah, there was a strange fella there in a clown suit. Mm-hmm. I figured he was with the carnival, as we've heard a few times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, But he uh, kind of keeps on going with, yeah, and then I've seen him around town. Because Thurgood's, what, like 95? I think I, I, I think. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, because he was 18 in 1904. So at this point, he's like 95. And he's like, yeah, I've, I've seen him from time to time. And, you know, threw up, but never really a talkative fellow or whatever, or never really spoke to him. And it's just like, it's again, that dairy mindset of, eh, it's just normal. It's just it kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean, if you've never been, what is that? Like, if you've never been directly affected by the, by the clown, by it, and you just know he's there, well, it doesn't affect me, not yeah. personally, even though it probably does indirectly, but it's not an explicit thing at you, then what do you care? Like, oh yeah, it's just some guy. Yeah, It's just the way it is. No, exactly. And uh, one thing we should touch on is the lynching itself. Uh, yeah. After uh, Hero is captured by the police or just kind of sits there and waits for him to come. Right. He's taken, and then all of a sudden, everybody's up in arms. You know, the people from other bars hear about it. And then there's some from that same bar that are like, mm-hmm. wait, we got to go do something. Literally, it was just happening and you did nothing. Now, again, right. you've seen the mob mentality that kicks in and dairy under its influence just pushes everybody to that and and i agree with you the mom tell you but like i wonder how much is it like dulling the senses of everybody so that he gets the most amount of deaths possible mm-hmm. he got he got the um all of the people that hero chopped up and then he got hero if they had stopped it earlier yeah. if the people had been i don't know awake enough to stop it earlier than he would then it wouldn't have had as much death to pull from yeah no absolutely I, I i do absolutely agree with you and then also on top of that uh six months before they got all of her he got all of her friends and, yes and it, it makes you think the way again as we were talking about earlier was that the first maybe or that generation's losers uh like yeah the Hero, maybe because the way they followed uh oh I just, hartwell hartwell thank you you know they followed him and uh it, it and so Pennywise wanted to make sure, as you said, to get the most deaths, but also wanted to finish Hero off because he was part of the original. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Group. I don't know. The other thing to think about is like, it doesn't choose sides. If there's a good side and a bad side, it doesn't choose sides. Mm-hmm. It He just like, I, he wants everybody to get hurt and die. So he'll help both. Exactly. So I need to find this next quote here that I had highlighted. It's towards the end. Uh it's a line from Mike, uh, but there's a problem. Kids grow up. In the church, power is per- perpetrated. Yeah, perpetrated. Perpetuated. Perpetuated, thank you. And renewed by periodic ritualistic acts. In dairy, power seems to be perpetrated. Per- thank you. Say it again. Perpetuated. Perpetuated. And renewed by periodic ritualistic acts, too. Can it be that it protects itself by the simple fact that as the children grow into adults, they become either incapable of faith or crippled by a sort of spiritual and imaginative arthritis? It's something we've talked about. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. and as we said on the last episode, uh, believing is or seeing isn't believing. Believe believing is seeing. Did I get that mm-hmm. right? Okay, I believe so. Okay, <laughs> it was your quote, so I wanted to make sure I did that justice. And it's kind of that thing of uh, adults lose the ability to believe, and uh, as Mike puts it, imaginative arthritis because they don't have the ability to you know fathom that something not quote unquote real is real Mm -hmm. and so they just ignore it and that's a good reason for that dulling of the senses as you put it that pennywise can take advantage of especially in dairy because there's something in the water 
Oh, and that's a bad, bad, bad something. All right. It looks like you've got one more kind of idea here about Pennywise itself, himself, yeah, itself. So Pennywise, it, it, it does consume flesh, but that's not what it feeds off of. It feeds off faith, not mm-hmm. food. And as I was kind of just going with that quote of, because Pennywise himself tells uh, Henry back in the insane asylum, I need them to believe. I, I can't guarantee that they're going to believe me, but they'll believe you or they'll, you know, have fear in you. Uh, if they don't right. believe in me, I can't feed off of them. So, and that's kind of the point of uh, where where it's coming from, like, until they're dead. Like, he can feed off any of the dead, but he can't kill them until they believe in him. And so that's that's more of his food source than anything else. It's not even just the fear, it's the faith. Yes, I agree. I think I think the food helps to drive the fear. Like he he he'll he'll eat and chew and whatever because that makes them afraid, not because he has to. Yeah. Fear is our friend, not food. All right. So we're going to jump to our next section which is usually called questions for the new reader. But he's not here. He's not here. But my question can be answered. Uh, just it, It's an everybody question. Sure. Why did the lumberman call the Brentwood Arms Hotel the floating dog? Dude, I don't know. I had the same question. <laughs> Do you know? No clue. It's the randomest thing, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's... It, it it would make sense if it was like the floating hotel or uh, like float, float wood uh, arms hotel or something, but... I, I don't know. Maybe it's like how if you're driving on Highway 64, but everybody from St. Louis calls it Highway 40 for absolutely no good reason. Like, it's just what you do. Yeah. I, I, Maybe it's something like that. True. That's maybe, the best I got. I want to actually, you know what? I want to say they have a pool, an in, indoor or in-ground pool, and there just used to be a dog that swam all day long. <laughs> so they're like, hey, let's go to the hotel. Let, let's go hang out at the hotel. Which one? Uh, the one where the dog swims, the floating dog hotel. Maybe there's like a random, even just like a painting of a dog in a pool hanging yeah, in the bar the of the hotel. Yeah. Sure. Sure. There you go. A lake. Because it's, <laughs> it's, you know, a hundred and some odd years ago. So yeah, probably. There yeah. you go. All right, next section is called My Favorite Thing. So, Bench, what was your favorite thing in this chapter? The casual murderous rampage was so well described. It just, mm-hmm. again, as I said, it was like seven pages of a rampage and killing. And it was just, like, as much of a slog as it was, it was entertaining to read. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you want to know how to chop people up, not that I'm condoning that at all. <laughs> right. All right, my favorite thing was just Drunk Mike. Mike is very prim and proper. I mean, he's a librarian for crying out loud, right? Like yeah. prim and proper and straight laced. So to see him just kind of shit faced drunk and writing about it. And like when you call yourself drunk, that's when you know you're drunk. Oh, I'm drunk and fun- or funk and drunk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I. It's just entertaining to me that it was just blatantly it all out there. So. All right, so I think that wraps us up for today. This was a quick one because it was only 18 pages. Before we jump to our closing, though, to our loyal listeners, we want to warn you. Chapter 19 is massive. It is an incredibly long chapter, and there's a lot of really important things that happen in this chapter. So we decided to, much like we've done in the past, to chop it up into pieces. Um, We are going to read... We are going to read three sections per episode. So next week we will be discussing um, the first three sections. So be warned if you're reading along with us, you don't have to read the whole thing, just a little bit. Until then, though, find us on social media at Floats Down Here. You can send us your digital balloons, red or otherwise, at floatsdownhere at gmail.com. Find us online at thepodcastapp.com where you can click our support us page. We have t shirts available at our T Public store. Go ahead and check those out. Um, we are adding new merchandise at all the time anyway. So go ahead and check them out. Order your very own Floats Down Here t shirt. You can even turn it into a cell phone case or a handbag or a pillow. 
subscribe and rate on iTunes. We really appreciate everybody who hits that um, subscribe and gives us stars on there as well. This show and all of our shows at thepodcastthat.com are produced with the love and support of our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons. Learn more about our rewards tier at patreon.com slash stayimaginary. Join us next time when we discuss chapter number 19 in The Watches of the Night, part one, the Dairy Public Library, 1.15 a.m., part two, Lower Main Street, 11.30 a.m., and part three, the Dairy Public Library, 1.55 a.m. You'll flow too. Stay imaginary. Thanks. <laughs>